Okay, let's call to order the Longmont Planning Zoning Commission meeting for March 22nd, 2017. First item on the agenda is call to order. Or is it the roll call? Commissioner Height? All right. Commissioner Teta? Here. Commissioner Rodriguez? Here. Commissioner Poland? Here. Commissioner Goldberg? Here. Commissioner Flagg? Here. Commissioner Kohler? Here. Councilmember Finley? Here. Next item on the agenda is communication. So, uh, Planning and Development Service Director Joni Marsh. Good evening, Commissioners. So at the dais this evening, you all have a shiny new Planning Commissioner book that um, we have provided for you to uh, take a look at. And um, it's a good 101 and provides some other information. Um, as I told many of you, we used to have a, a different model, but it was getting a little long in the tooth. So um, we got some new ones for everybody. Um, so please take a look. There won't be a quiz, but I could change my mind later. Um, <laughs> and then, <laughs> okay, so Bonnie's going to do the quizzing. Excellent. I like it. Um, and then also I'd, I'd like to introduce our new alternate, Jeff Check, who is here in the audience this evening. Jeff is hey, our Jeff. new alternate, so um, just so you know who he is, and he's here to uh, take in Planning Commission this evening. And that's all I have. Thanks very much. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the public invited to be heard. This is in case somebody out in the public would like to come forward and speak about an issue that is not on the agenda for today. We'll give you five minutes to go ahead and talk to us. Was there anybody signed up? Nobody signed up? Is anybody out there would like to come forward? If not, I'll go ahead and close the public invited to be heard. The next item on the agenda is Project Bronco Height Exceptions. Principal Planner Don Burchett. Good evening, Chairman Poland, members of the Planning Commission, Don Burchett with Planning Development Services Division. I'm here tonight to do a uh, brief presentation on the staff uh, uh, review of this project. The project before you here that we're looking at again is Project Bronco and it, it contains height exceptions uh, to the restrictions for height in the BLI zoning district. The location of the property is shown up on the screen in red. The property in red that's outlined is the ultimate um, lot that will be created through the subdivision process that we're currently processing on this uh, development application. Uh, just to give everybody kind of an idea of where this sits in space here in the city of Longmont, this is on our eastern edge of the city of Longmont. And the Highway 119 is down to the south, and across the street here is Sandstone Ranch. County Line Road is on the left-hand side of the screen. The McLean Western building here that I think most people are familiar with. The Fairview Avenue, uh, Fairview Street, I'm sorry, is... Uh, the street that's currently constructed out in this subdivision that goes to what we used to call the Concepts Direct Building. That was the name of it when it was originally developed. The property will be located at the south or at the northwest corner of what will be Fairview, which will be extended along its eastern boundary and Peak Avenue, which is to its south. The area in general that is depicted out here, you again have McLean Western, you have agricultural properties up to the north. On the east side, we have an existing uh, oil and gas well that was uh, recently done out in um, Fire Firestone. I get them confused. I'm sorry, Frederick Firestone. Sorry. And then uh, we have a uh, subdivision that was done through a PUD process out in um, Weld County that is Longview subdivision. The Envision Longmont uh, comprehensive plan identifies this property as primary employment. The Fairview extension is identified as a collector street. It's kind of underneath the red line there outlining the property. Uh, again, to the north, we have the Eastern Buffer, which is made up of mostly of City of Longmont properties that are purchased for open space and expansions of Union Reservoir in the future. Uh, again, County Line Road as a arterial and then Highway 119, which is identified as a regional arterial, and then Sandstone Ranch to the south. The applications that you're going to be considering tonight, there are two height exception requests. The first height exception is for the construction of four 70-foot silos. These silos would need a 25-foot height exception in order to be uh, constructed as they're currently shown in your materials in the packet. 
The second height exception is for a 10 foot height exception for a condenser cooling tower and for thermal oxidizers that are located on the roof of this proposed building. Uh, those would need a 10 foot additional height variance in order for those to be allowed uh, and approved. Planning Commission tonight is the decision making body on the height exceptions. Uh, you have three options tonight. You can approve the height exception, conditionally approve or deny the request. Staff, as we've identified in the uh, packet through our review of the review criteria, feel that the requests are justified. We are recommending approval of the application. That's outlined in PZR 2016-A. And at this time, what I will do is uh, ask Mary Frances Stotler with the Dennis Group, who is the applicant's representative, to uh, come up and do a presentation. And once she is done with her presentation, then we will uh, go ahead and answer any questions that you have at that time. So if I can get that to come up here for her. Very good. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don, and thank you, Council, for having us in today. We really appreciate the time. My name is Mary Frances Stotler. I'm with the Dennis Group. We are the design build firm that is working with Smuckers on this project, Bronco, here. And I've come just to walk through the background of the height exception, um, walk through some of the particulars of the plant, and then answer any questions you may have. So, to give an overall synopsis of the project, uh, we're looking at a two-phase project. It's about 585,000 square feet in total. And um, the, the product being produced at this food manufacturing facility will be the Smucker's Uncrustable Sandwich. Um, it will be the second Smucker's Uncrustable plant in the US. Um, phase one, which is set to break ground this spring, will be just shy of 400,000 square feet. Um, currently, we're looking to situate on a uh, parcel with the height restriction of 45 feet, the business light industrial, as Don alluded to. And we're looking for exception to the height, uh, height variance, uh, exception to the height restriction for the ingredient silos, the thermal oxidizer, and the evaporative condenser. So, not to, not to repeat what Don said, but a general location of the facility. Um, as he pointed out, McLean uh, over here to the west, Walmart to the south, Ken Pratt Boulevard on the south. And to give some background on the project in general and how the building evolved, food, food manufacturing and food processing is a very specific type of construction where food safety is the primary concern. The way we design food manufacturing facilities is we start with the process and then wrap the building around the process. Everything from the roof design, wall design, st structural steel slab, it's all in the service of food safety and making sure that we have an operational, operationally efficient and food safe plant. So in setting the overall building geometry, we started with the equipment inside of the plant. And there were two things that really drove the overall height of the building. The one being our continuous mixer system in our bakery. Um, that's just over 28 feet. And the way, we, uh, the way we designed the facility is you have the process and then you have a walk-on ceiling and all of the utilities above the walk-on ceiling. So you're trying to eliminate any kind of ledge, uh, crevice, uh, area of harborage that's in the process facility. So all of the utilities, all of your seam compressed air resides above this walk-on ceiling. And that's what really sets the height of our building. So on the bakery side, it's the, it's the continuous dough mixer. And then on the storage freezer side, the process, we, um, we bake the bread on site, we bring in peanut butter and jelly from other Smucker's facilities in the US, we assemble the sandwiches, they go through a spiral freezer, and then they're held in a storage freezer on site for seven days. We designed our storage freezer to accommodate this seven, seven day hold. And in designing the geometry of the storage freezer, we want to get as vertical as possible to limit the overall imperviousness on site. So we're not dealing with you know, a 700,000 or 800,000 square foot building. Um, so with our racking stack up for that pallet in the storage freezer, that's another thing driving our overall building height to 40 foot height. The other two anchors that <coughs> 
determine building placement on this given site are rail and then the silo adjacency to the bakery. Um, so when we started looking for sites for, for this project before Longmont was selected, rail was a very crucial factor because we're looking uh, for rail access in terms of bringing raw ingredients to the facility. Um, the, uh, Longmont had uh, a lot of great things to offer and then the, the access to rail was you know, a really important driving point with this site. And where we position the building on the site is determined by taking, making use of this rail access. The other thing in determining, you know, we have the rail access, which we unload the flour into the silos, and then we're looking with our building layout adjacency from the silos to the bakery. So to give you an idea um, in terms of the overall site plan, we have Peak Avenue bordering the site on the south. This is the extension of Fairview that will border the east side of the property. This is the greenway, to the, the future greenway to the west of the property. And the rail access, um, in order for our turnout, we have to be a certain distance away from both the, the limit of the radius of the rail coming in this way. So the rail, the Great Western Rail comes in this way, continues on. So there's a minimum distance from the limit of this radius that our turnout can begin. On the western side of the site, there's a bridge, and there's also a minimum distance from the bridge that we can begin our turnout. And that really dictates where on site, we have a, a limited area where we can begin that turnout and have that, um, that rail radius. So that drove us to a more eastern orientation of the building on site. The silos are immediately adjacent to the rail car building. And the silos blow um, into the facility uh, flour de delivery to the mixers, which are located in this bakery. And if you look at the facility overall, the, the product moves from an east to west as you're looking at the site plan direction. So raw ingredients come in, bakery through to assembly, and then the storage freezer on the west. So both that rail uh, location on site and the silo adjacency to the bakery are driving us to that particular position on site. Looking at the review criteria analysis for the height exception being requested, we are requesting 25 feet height exception to the 45 foot maximum for the silos. The silos house our flour and liquid ingredients. Um, if you look at the footprint of the silos, compared to the overall site, we're at about 64 acres for the site. The silo footprint will be 1,125 square feet. So we're looking at 0.00041% of the overall site will be the silo uh, for which we are requesting the, the height exception. The design improvements that we are taking, um, uh, that we're, we are including into the project um, in order to meet the, 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 the criteria to be granted the height exception revolve around three areas. Over the road to delivery of the silos, food safety, and site imperviousness. So when we looked at the geometry of the silos, the first question is why not make a wider, shorter silo? Um, we limit the silo to the maximum over the road distance to limit traffic disruption and allow an easy delivery to site. So we don't have to have any road closures or police escorts to get the silo from the location of manufacture to the site. Uh, with the maximum over the road distance, that's what determines our 70 foot height on the, on the silo. The other reason that we go with four larger silos, taller silos than, than multiple smaller silos, we, that would fall under that 45 foot is limiting the critical control points for the raw materials. Um, so one of the main tenets of food safety is limiting your possible points of contamination. Um, so if we duplicate the number of silos, if we have eight instead of four, that's, eight, that's four additional control points that we have to accommodate for areas of potential infestation or uh, harborage to account for. So we're looking to limit the amount of control points. Um, the last thing is site imperviousness. So looking if we went to eight 45 foot silos in lieu of four 70 foot silos, we'd be having a bigger overall imperviousness on site. We'd have to have uh, double the foundation 
and increasing our site imperviousness. Looking at the evaporative condensers, we're seeking a 10-foot exception to the 55-foot mechanical height maximum uh, in the business light industrial district. The evaporative condenser is about a thousand square feet uh, footprint. So in terms of the overall building footprint, that's 0.00171% of the overall building footprint that the evaporative condensers account for. And the reason for their location is adjacency to the refrigeration room and the spiral freezers. The design improvements we've incorporated uh, in order to meet the criteria of the statute are operational efficiency, energy efficiency, and site design. Um, in terms of operational efficiency, the, uh, the evaporative condenser is part of the ammonia refrigeration system, which uh, provides cooling to the spiral freezers and the holding, holding freezer on site. Uh, it needs to be located directly above the ammonia room. Um, uh, it's a, it's a cooling tower, so you need that, that upward uh, transfer of heat in order, to, in order to properly work. In terms of energy efficiency, if we were to ground locate the evaporative condensers, you would add an extra series of piping and pumps to get the, uh, to get the refrigeration to the evaporate, evaporative condenser. So it's a, it would be added energy in order to, uh, to reroute and repipe and pump to a ground mounted instead of allowing the natural transfer of heat upward. In terms of site design, if we were to ground mount, we would add additional imperviousness. We would add an additional foundation uh, to support this evaporative condenser on the ground. And then looking at the uh, wrong direction. Looking at the thermal oxidizer review criteria analysis, we're seeking a 10-foot exception for the evaporative condenser or for the thermal oxidizer as well, for a 65-foot overall height of the thermal oxidizer. Um, it's about 360 square foot on the roof, uh, which is 0.00615% of the total building footprint. The thermal oxidizer is a piece of equipment we use to treat emissions coming out of the bakery. Um, it captures the exhaust out of the bakery ovens, processes the, the exhaust to reduce volatile organic compounds in the exhaust before being released to air. It's a required piece of uh, equipment in order to meet our emissions limit for our state air permit. Um, and the design improvements are similar to the, uh, to the evaporative condenser where the overall operational efficiency uh, requires this piece of equipment to be located above the bakery. Since it's receiving the exhaust stack, it needs to be located above the bakery exhaust. Again, with an energy efficiency, if we were to ground uh, locate this piece of equipment, we would require additional piping and blowing to get the exhaust to a ground-mounted piece of equipment. And if we were to ground mount this piece of equipment, there would be additional foundation required, which would increase our site imperviousness. So looking at the overall site plan from a shade shadow analysis, we looked at the, the shadows being cast from these pieces of equipment over the, that exceed the 45 foot height limitation on December 21st at 9 a.m. noon and 3 p.m. This right here is the evaporative condenser. This is the thermal oxidizer. And here are the silos. And then giving you an idea of this overall appearance of the building and appearance of the equipment relative to the overall building, this is an elevation from the north. So looking from the railroad track south to the building, this is the this is the uh, the thermal oxidizer. This is the evaporative condenser. Silos. Looking from the east. Silos. Thermal oxidizer. And here's a view from the east. So this is a before and after rendering without our facility and with our facility. This is taken from the housing development to the east of the site. So this is the current oil and gas setup. This is the view with the addition of our facility. 
This is the view from the south. So this is, would be our main entrance view. This is our main office entrances, our bakery entrance. I should note too, um, uh, as an aside to food safety, we go so far as segregating our workforce where we want to limit contact between people who work on the bakery side and people who work on the assembly side. So there's no transfer of things before they've been um, through a kill step, so a cook or freezing process, and things after. Um, so from here onward, we consider ready to eat. There's still raw ingredients here, so we look to separate that. Um, things that have not been baked, cooked through our oven process yet. Um, this, again, evaporative condensers, thermal oxidizer, and the silos. This is a view from the south. This is from 119. So this is after the addition of our facility. This is the western elevation, evaporative condenser, thermal oxidizer with silos in the, in the background. This is the view from the west. This is from Zlatan Drive without the facility and with the addition of the facility. And here's a few um, uh, renderings of our entrances. We've We've included in the design uh, atypical of a food facility. Typical construction is insulated metal panel. They're very functional. Um, we're looking for sanitary. There's usually not a lot of aesthetics that go into that, but knowing um, you know the the design aesthetic and the the look and feel of the Longmont community, we've taken some care to to make the entrance of our building, the main office entrances and the bakery entrance, have a look and feel that's more commensurate with the local community. Um, so incorporating glass curtain walls, stone decorative, uh, uh, decorative feature here. So this is the main entrance, this is the bakery entrance. And here's a rendering of the, the main entrance to the facility. That's everything I have at the moment. I'd welcome any questions from the council. Okay, thank you, Ms. Stotler. Thank Does you. anybody have any questions for the applicant or for Don at this time? Sure, I do. Commissioner Height. Um, Don, my first question is um, for you, which is the building, as I understand it, is 40 feet high, and the exception that I read that we can grant automatically is 10 feet from 45 feet, which I guess is the permitted height, are we allowed to go from what as built or from what is permitted for this 10 foot exception? I think I follow you, but could you say that one more time? Sure. Um, as I, well, first of all, I, I, the BLI zone, I understand, has a height limitation of 45 feet. Correct. And there is an exception um, that can be granted for 10 feet, to ex I think it may even be administratively approvable, for a 10-foot exception of that building height limitation, at least for chimneys or smokestacks or rooftop equipment. Um, and I think that's in... 1505010 somewhere, yeah. 0103C. Okay. So my question is, do we measure the 10 feet from the 45 foot height limitation or from the 40 foot as built building? Can we go to 55 feet or only 50 because this building is only going to be 40 feet high? I, I will confirm, but the way that I had read it was that it was from the maximum height in this district, okay. so that would be the 10 feet. But I mean from I, 45 feet to 55 feet. Correct. Stop and I'll have questions for you. Okay. One of the biggest concerns or conditions that I understood for you for these silos was that transporting them, as I understood it, there's a radius limitation on the size of this thing. You can travel it down a roadway without being, without having to have a police escort. Correct. It's not the length of the thing, it's the it's width. It's the width. It's, the width of the yep. Thing. Um, 
So that being a condition, as I look at, you have four 70-foot silos of a certain diameter, mm -hmm. which in my mind is 280 <coughs> feet of some type of storage. In my math, if you took it down to 55 feet, which I just confirmed to me possibly is the limit that we could work with, you would go to 5.09 units, call it five units. Could you work with a 55 foot five unit dimensional setting of the same radius so you could still transport this thing? It would just be 55 feet instead of 70. And I'd you have, only have to add one more silo. I'd have to look at the math on how that, how that works out, limiting to 55 feet with the radius. Then um, my third question with the condenser unit and the thermal oxidizers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming those things have to be, do they have to be upright or could they be wider and shorter? Could they be turned on their side? Or do they have to be this 20 foot higher than the? the for the for the geometry of what we need to fit in the oxidizer, we've limited the height to the amount that we can with both the evaporative condenser and the thermal oxidizer. We've limited the height to what would be a, um, a piece of equipment that you could get from a manufacturer. If not, we'd have to go to something that's custom built that hasn't been tested before. Um, I think right now that's the questions that I had. <clears throat> Commissioner Teta. I had the uh, same thought as uh, Judd did about five instead of four, but um, I have a question for Don, actually. Don, the uh, height limit in mixed use is 10 feet higher than in BLI. Do you know, give me your opinion on why do you think it's 55 in mixed use instead of 45? Uh, Chairman Pullen, and, Pullen uh, Commissioner Teta, the the intent and I guess the direction that we had gotten through the creation of the regulations for the mixed use zone was that we were trying to encourage additional height for additional units to try to reduce the overall development costs for the residential that could be built in a built in a mixed use building, and therefore we were trying to go to more stories that would help to reduce the overall cost. Um, so that's where that's, that, that, that difference came from when we did the mixed-use district. And then even more subjective, maybe, where do you think the uh, impetus for height restrictions came about originally anyway? Why, why is it that we think limiting height is a good idea? Chairman Poland, Commissioner Tutta, um, you know, I've said a million times, you know, I've worked here a long time. Um, when I first started, some of the items that we heard constantly were concerns by the citizens of Longmont of that we were more of a suburban community. We were not seen as a urban, very dense, um, overly developed community that we had a lot of open space area and that some of the goals of the community was to keep that character and to keep that ability to still see the mountains and feel as though it's a, it's a small town. Ways that you can do that is you can try and limit building sizes so that you don't have buildings that look completely out of scale with the adjacent community that it's trying to fit into. And so my understanding of why when we did the land development code update back in 2001, the code that we're under currently today, was that, again, the concerns of the community was the losing of views uh, of the mountain backdrop, those kind of uh, aesthetics that really drove limiting the height of the uh, city of Longmont zoning districts. We actually increased uh, this height limit uh, within probably the last five, maybe six years to the 45 that it is. At one time, we actually had a 30 foot height limit in the zoning district. So, you know, we, we have slowly, as I think our community has grown up and started to see that height isn't necessarily bad uh, as long as it is in good context and has good design, people seem to accept that and appreciate it. And therefore, we have been able to uh, raise those height limits. I do expect that some of the discussion that we're going to have with the Planning Commission through our current update is whether or not some of these other zonings 
districts that are going to be created should in fact also have higher uh, height limits than what we currently have. But that, that would be my explanation as to why we have the height limits that we have. Okay. Commissioner Flagg. Hi, this, this question is actually for the applicant, Don. Great. Hello. I notice on your proposed elevations, the renderings that you've done against the actual landscape out there, um, and it, it seems that your building is mostly trying to hug the ground, it's long and low, but the two, or well, the four silos plus the rather large tower there you're showing the silos in white, which contrasts with the mountain, mm -hmm. and the black silo, which definitely calls attention to itself. Mm -hmm. Are you attached to these color choices on this particular building? The, I think the, we, could, uh, we could look at other, other colors. Um, it might be some of the printout too. The, the black for the screening will actually be an architectural screen. It won't be... Um, black uh, per se and on the silo we could we could look if there's other other color options take that under consideration have you thought about that notorious flagpole color that you see it's sort of a grayish scale kind of a color that tends to blend in generally speaking and I wondered if you'd thought about that color as applicable to anything that comes above that red line along your roof? Just a question. I, we, we haven't looked at that yet, but we certainly can. Thank you. Commissioner Kohler. Um, were any renderings done of the view from the Union Reservoir? I mean, from my perspective, if I'm a driver coming down 119, you sort of expect this area to be a little industrial with some mm -hmm. of the other uses out there. But if you're a recreationist at Union looking to the south, I'm wondering if, if you have any ideas of what that would look like if that was considered. We haven't looked at that currently, but we certainly can. And then um, my other question was maybe for um, Dawn, do we know, sorry, it feels like we granted a height exception for the hospital. Do you happen to know how high it was and what that might be relative to this Uh, Chairman Poland, Commissioner Kohler, um, it, I, I can look that up for you here in just a second, but we believe it's about 72 feet uh, to the top of the, you know, the flying ceiling out there, <laughs> the eyebrow. There you go. I don't know if they'd appreciate me calling it that, but, uh, but uh, we can double check that for you here pretty quick. Uh, just let me get on my computer. 70. But we can confirm that for you here in just a second. Commissioner Height. Commissioner Flagg uh, reminded me of what my last question was um, for the applicant. Um, our standard requires for, to grant a height exception um, that there's some type of creative design that needs mm -hmm. to be incorporated into the, into, the, into the structure that meets the purpose and intent of the standard that's being exceeded um, mm -hmm. and represents an improvement in quality. Mm -hmm over what could have been accomplished by strict application of, of the standard. Um, and I know that in our referral material there were references to, um, <coughs> and, and I think you referenced to it too, that, that some of the, the architectural facade to the entryway um, and to the, I, I guess it was to the entryway, right. um, kind of met that standard. And I'm, and, and I'm not sure because it doesn't appear to apply to the condenser unit or the or the um, oxidizer mm -hmm. and or the silos what kind of specific design elements have you incorporated into those three units that that make it better or, or creative or help so we've incorporated architectural screening into into the evaporative condenser and the thermal oxidizer and we've um, we've dressed up the entrance in order to uh, you know, uh, counter counterbalance some of the more industrial looking pieces. We've also located the silos so that they they will be sandwiched behind the eventual rail building, so they'll be partially shielded when that rail building is built. Okay, 
do we have any other questions at this time seeing none um, this is a public hearing um, so at this time I'll go ahead and open up the public hearing portion for this agenda item we do not have anybody signed up if anybody in the audience at this time would like to come forward we'll give you five minutes to uh, give your opinions uh, we just ask that you come down you state your name and your address um, at this time does anybody want to come down seeing nobody coming forward I'll go ahead and close the public invited to be heard for this item move it back to the council or to the Commission for further discussion for the questions Commissioner Rodriguez uh, hello um, I would say overall that this is a little bit different than what generally comes in front of us in the sense of how industrialized it is in nature. Uh, and as somebody who has been a commercial baker in his past, I'm very, very cognizant of food safety rules as, as well as point of contact issues. And so therefore, I, I don't have so much of an issue with the oxidizer, the evaporative condensers, as well as the silo issues. Um, and I think that through the renderings and the uh, shade studies provided, that there's going to be very minimal uh, impact to any views in the Longview neighborhood, which would be the neighborhood I'd be more worried about as far as views, and considering there's nobody here to speak against that on their behalf, uh, I, I can only say that I am for these exceptions in the sense that I believe that a strong need and necessity in Longmont is primary employment, and this project does provide primary employment to the city at large. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rodriguez. Joan Chair, Marsh. Chair Poland, um, confirmation the UC Health height variance was 74 feet 8 inches. Thank you. Don, I do have a question. I believe when I read through the packet, there was mention, at least maybe earlier on, about needing a variance from the well to the east. Yes, I did read that too. It, it was the applicant had said. Yeah, the said. applicant had, had noted something about that in the packet. Is, is that anything we need to worry about? Uh, Chairman Poland, no. The uh, regulations that would that we have regarding our oil and gas wells are only uh, applicable to those wells that are within the city limits. We, can't, we, we do not have it written that we apply those regulations to uh, wells that are outside of our city limits. So we, we can't review and comment on them, so we cannot, then the way the regs were set up is that we do not then use them in, in our, to meet our, any of our standards either. And then I'll note this is for your Mr. Stapler. Um, the well, and when I looked at the the, the view from the east, your rendering, um, it was kind of hard sometimes maybe to pick out the well from your building at that distance. Do you know how high some of the that the height of that well area is, the, the well equipment by chance? I don't have that information. Okay, thank you. Don? So, so I haven't stood right next to it, uh, to that equipment, but um, when I did my site visit to look out there, an estimate for the highest equipment that's out there is probably in the 16 to 20 foot tall range for the highest equipment that's out there on that, on, the, for that on, on there. And okay. again, that's located about on the west third of that uh, property between Longview yep. and this property. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Teta. Like uh, Commissioner Rodriguez, I'm uh, in favor of uh, everything that they're requesting seems f purposeful, um, necessary. I, I'd like them to at least look into the uh, five silo rather than four. It seems like a simple solution, but it's a big property. Um, I feel like we set the precedent with the hospital at that 74 feet, so I don't really have a, a tremendous 
issue or problem with that, especially in light of the 500 and some odd jobs that they're going to bring. Um, I have a couple quick questions for Don, though. Um, I don't know that this is a question, but I'm curious if that might be the uh, biggest uh, number of square foot in a manufacturing facility um, that we would have if we have anything comparable, but that's not necessarily a question. I have a question about the um, the uh, financial incentives that we gave to them. That's Is it a tax increment financing? Is it uh, did we gift them or some of the property? Um, it was kind of vague in the in the material. I knew that so I'd read something about it in the paper. Um, in Poland, Commissioner Teta, that's uh, that's above me. I I I did not follow or read through or track what incentives were offered. Oh, um, so, Jessica. Oh, let's have Jessica Erickson from yes. the Economic um, Development Partnership run down that list for you. So unfortunately, sorry, Commissioner uh, Poland and, uh, or, yeah, sorry, and Commissioners, uh, I don't have the complete details of the incentive package um, with me, so I'm not going to commit to exact numbers, um, but we'll outline what the incentive package was and what it entailed. Um, so we did a uh, rebate of development fees related to uh, the construction of the new facility. Um, we also did a rebate of business personal property tax. Uh, we look, or we're doing a rebate of 100% of business personal property tax for the first four years of each phase with a 50% rebate on the second four years of each phase. In addition to that, there were some concessions related to public improvements on the property, including the completion of uh, Fairview Road, the installation of a uh, traffic signal at Fairview and 119 if deemed necessary by traffic study, which I believe it now has, and uh, the completion of the Spring Gulch Trail to the west of the property. The total value of the incentive package, we estimate, based on estimates of the total investment, we estimate to be about $6.5 million with all of those things combined over the course of 10 or 12 years. Thank you. I just had one uh, last question for Don. Um, maybe not a question as much as a comment. The 500-foot uh, notice, um, to me, strikes me as not being enough simply because how many different property owners could there be within 500 feet? I feel like there's got to be a, uh, like an either-or approach when, when there are so few property owners involved, um, a way that we could get you know, three or four deep uh, in every direction maybe. Um, um, still... I guess that would be 20 or 25 property owners altogether. Is that a crazy idea? You know, we 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 did expand it uh, from the 150 foot. Um, I'll be honest with you. When we were looking at it, we were trying to make sure that we were trying to get a, a good a good mix of people. My biggest concern, honestly, was the. Uh, residences that were between McLean and um, the, the the facility itself as they were going to be the ones that were going to be built up next to and adjacent and so that was really what I was trying to expand to get because my fear was that we weren't going to get all of those residences and give them an opportunity when it's going to be really in their backyard literally so that was what I I, I worked with to determine to expand it um, Hindsight, should I have expanded it to try to grab some of the Longview neighborhood? I, I think sitting here today we could say yes, um, but, you know, at, at some point, it, you know, is it how, how much further do I need to go from 150? I, I, I felt like that over doubling it was a good attempt to try to make sure that those people who were directly and closely going to be impacted, that they had that opportunity to come, and that's, that's why we ended up with that 500 feet. So there was not an, you know, we didn't specifically try to exclude them at all. We were trying to make sure we grabbed those adjacent neighbors so that they were covered. Commissioner Goldberg. Hey, Don. Uh, regarding the uh, neighborhood meeting, 
there were more attendees at the neighborhood meeting than were, were here to speak tonight. I wonder if you could just summarize the temperament of that meeting and uh, just illustrate. I have the questions in front of me and the answers, but what was that meeting like? It was very cordial. Um, you know, again, we had a lar much larger turnout than we yeah. do tonight. Um, there, there's a couple of people here tonight that uh, attended that neighborhood meeting as well in the audience. Uh, they didn't choose to speak, um, but I, th I think everybody characterized it as uh, a good discussion. Uh, Mary Frances went through the presentation, showed them the designs of the building that she had generated at that time because, again, they hadn't s submitted yet, so sure. we were still going off some um, uh, draft elevation, so to speak. But we were trying to give them a good understanding of what kind of impact that was. And I would say that, you know, even the, the property owner who is directly to the west, uh, the partnership that owns the property where the oil and gas facility is, you know, their concern was, again, views. But when we talked about, you know, the location and proximity to the oil and gas facilities that were on that north end, and then I think that picture that Mary Frances had with at the end of the street out of Longview looking across, I, you, you're not seeing the, build, the new building behind it. You're seeing the oil and gas facility. So I think the explanation of that, the oil and gas facility is probably blocking more views than uh, this facility is going to seem to be a reasonable explanation uh, to them. Uh, and I have received no phone calls. Um, no, I, I, I must correct myself. I received one phone call from a mineral right owner asking whether or not this property was affected their minerals. And I explained to them that I couldn't answer that. That what we do is Weld County keeps a database of everyone who has mineral rights for a section of land, so 640 acres, and explained to her that the notices went out based on that I could not tell her that her minerals were under this property or anywhere in the area that would be impacted by this development. I asked her to contact her contact for, asked her to contact her contact, uh, with the people who own her mineral rights that she's leased them to because they also would have received notice and they should have been able to tell her whether or not it was going to impact her mineral rights ownership and, and the lease. So uh, I never got anything back from her, and that was a couple weeks ago. But no one had any concerns or called me at all regarding the height exception or the applications that we've notified for the site plan, the plat, the height exceptions, nothing. Thank you. Sometimes uh, during these uh, neighborhood meetings, concerns come up, and then uh, we look favorably upon a, a developer or a an uh, applicant that responds to the concerns of the neighborhood. Uh, were there any concerns brought up during the meeting that warranted a change in the plan or warranted the applicant to modify something about their project? I, I, I can't think of any standing here. Um, you know, some of the con one of the concerns that wasn't related necessarily, I mean, it was, but it, it was the, the odor question. Right? I mean, are we going to be smelling peanut butter? Are we smelling right. jelly? Are we smelling bread? You know, and then Mary Frances explained, like she did tonight, the process. And that with that thermal, is it the thermal oxidizer that is required by the state to help with the odor emissions, that they shouldn't be impacted. So, I mean, again, the facility that we need one of the exceptions for is something that's meant to reduce the impacts on the neighbors themselves so it it there wasn't a change that i can think of um no i can't i can't think of any how tall are the uh silos at the sugar beet plant closer to uh pace and third i i have no idea <laughs> Looking at Joni, wondering if she has, no? You know, the sugar mill isn't even in the city limits, so we don't have uh, any okay. details on that in our office. We can, we can look it up on the web. Thank you. Uh, I guess I have a couple questions for the applicant.
Commissioner Goldberg. Hey, Mary. Thanks Hi. for being here tonight. Thank you for having us. Um, I do want to echo some of Commissioner Rodriguez's comments. Uh, uh, I think our town is um, very fortunate to have Smuckers choose Longmont, and uh, for from the perspective of economic development and employment opportunities, and your guarantee and to uh, provide well-paying jobs in our town is is uh, something that we need and appreciate. So thank you. Um, man, my brain isn't on straight right now. Any idea how many silos you have at the other Smucker's Uncrustable plant that exists? Four. Four. Correct. Man, that shoots my argument down. <laughs> I suspect the Smucker's uh, business has other facilities, food handling facilities, that have more than four silos. Uh, and in turn, I suppose, more risk of uh, contamination and foodborne problems. Is that correct? I couldn't, I do not have knowledge of a facility at this time that has more than four silos. Mm. I would have to, I would have to confer. I don't have full knowledge of all facilities in the Smuckers, uh, in the Smuckers universe, just particular ones that the dentist group has worked on. But no, I, I can't identify any at this time that have more than four. Has Smuckers ever had any major food contamination issues uh, that could be attributed to the points of the opportunities for contamination, I suppose? I don't have any, any information of, of uh, any food, food safety or food contamination issues in Smuckers, uh, and that's kind of the point is, you know, a, a, a food safety, you know, if you have a listeria recall or, um, you know, an E. coli outbreak, that is damaging if not a, a you know, if not a, a death knell for a company. Sure. Hands down, the number one thing you want to do is make sure you're de delivering a safe quality product to your, your customers. And... Uh, Every effort is taken with the design and construction of the facility to limit any potential food hazard. Sure. Um, food Safety Modernization Act of 2016 has imposed a lot more stringent regulations on food producers, really looking to limit the amount of foodborne illnesses, sicknesses, and deaths in this country. Um, there's something like 6,000 foodborne illnesses each year in okay. this country. Uh, I'd have to I'd have to give you exact facts, but there's a significant there's a significant amount of foodborne illnesses um, in this country, and and as a uh, a producer of high quality safe food, that's something that we don't want to we don't want to compromise food safety a, at any time. Okay. Why didn't you ask for three silos that were even taller? It, it's not required, and based on the material makeup, so there will be two liquid silos, there will be two flour silos, okay. one for white flour, one for wheat flour. So it, it, there's not necessarily a um, saying you could have five silos, it, it doesn't, it's not necessarily linear with the ingredient mix. Okay. So really if you're, if you're looking at a shorter silo, you're looking at doubling the amount of silos. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So when I when another commissioner suggests proposes five silos instead of four, are you would the solution actually need to be six or it would need eight, to be eight. or basically you, it's four distinct ingredients. Mm -hmm. So whenever you make them shorter, you're looking at doubling. Got it from four to eight. I don't know your site plan enough. I not the one who designed it, but when I looked at the the site plan, it looked like four more silos could fit fairly nicely in line with where the first four are placed. It would take moving the rail radius a little bit to, okay. in order to accommodate that. You mentioned several reasons why um, you preferred the, uh, the four longer ones over shorter squatter ones. Uh, and you know, the challenge of transporting it, and I suspect the cost that goes into doing that, and the disruption to traffic. Uh, I suspect it's also more expensive for smokers to install eight silos, eight cement pads, eight trips 
rather than for? It's more additional equipment, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and when you get into a wide load, if you're carrying a, you know, a wide load silo across four to six states, it, it starts to get uh, into a, a challenging logistical maneuver. Not that it can't be done, but it, it's just it, it's it, it really ups the the disruption to to traffic across uh, across a long ways. Okay, I think that's all the questions I have for now. Um, Again, similar to Commissioner um, Rodriguez's comments, and I think Commissioner Teta uh, echoed them as well. Uh, I like the project. I like uh, having it in our town. I think we're very fortunate uh, to have Mary here before us, uh, working out the final details, rather than in another neighboring town that has a rail, a rail yard and a, and a convenient spot for, um, for silos. Um, I'm interested in hearing what the rest of the commission, uh, how the rest of the commission feels about the height, as it relates specifically to the height exception, uh, and uh, is this variance something that can be overcome? <clears throat> can these silos be built without a variance? Meaning, how strict should we be on the applicant relating to the height, height variance versus more silos? Commissioner Height. Um, I'll bite, Commissioner Goldberg. Um, my view with the, my view with the um, the thermal oxidizer and the vaporizer units are that um, it, it appears that certain types of efforts to come up with adequate screening, screening um, have been taken, um, and, I, and I think those probably do qualify for this height exception. With respect to the silos, though. I, I'm, I'm happy for your further probing questions to, to indicate that indeed five silos wouldn't work um, because you have four products and therefore either you need four or eight. Um, because originally I was going to say, yeah, I want you to come back and let me know if five would work, but now you just told me five won't work. But I'm still troubled with the fact that, and I don't know what kind of design element you could put into a silo um, to make it more the standard being um, to meet the purpose and intent of the standard that you're seeking to modify. I don't know exactly what it is that you would do with a silo, but I don't know that you've done anything to attempt to meet that condition, um, and I'm troubled by that. Commissioner Teta. I, uh, I hear a lot of people expressing some uh, reservations about the height with the silos, and that's it seems like a an awful lot of feet to be granting a variance for. Um, I feel uh, I feel like the five isn't going to work. Seemed like a great idea, but four um, or eight would be the right number. Uh, I don't want to be unreasonable. It may mean nothing. I another five feet probably doesn't doesn't. Uh, even register with anybody looking at it, but I wonder if we could uh, cap the height of the silos at the same 65 feet that we're looking to cap the overall height of the uh, the uh, manufacturing facility and the equipment on the roof at, for consistency's sake, uh, you know, shave five feet from each of the four silos. Um, I have no idea if that would be workable for them or not, um, but uh, but I feel like it could be consistent. If I may, the the geometry of the silo and the volume of the silo is to accommodate the unload of a full rail car of flour. So if we were to limit the height, and we would either fall into that over the road category by uh, getting wider or again fall into the area where we're duplicating silos. I got a comment to what? if I could interrupt. Uh, Commissioner uh, Judd, Commissioner Flake sorry. first. Thank you. I guess that uh, I don't think the commission's in the business of redesigning buildings. You know what works and you've told us what is needed and 
since we already approved on a sort of a rise in the ground, an eyebrow on a hospital, and that eyebrow will be sufficiently much higher than this even when it's built versus when this is built, I think. And I look at the renderings that you put in the packet. Um, it's two of nine, if you care to look at it. Um, and it, it basically, what you have is, is the proposed building mock-up against the mountains, and in it, the silos, even painted white, barely can be seen as opposed to the other building that um, is that dark black color, as I mentioned, and it stands out quite firmly against the mountain in the sky. I'm not as concerned about the height. I am concerned that um, we cause a delay in moving forward on a project that I think meets the criteria except for the height, and we have approved heights before in this area. The building is located, to my knowledge, in a field. And although it's not right next to housing, there is Longview, which is a piece away, and we don't have any perspective on that. But I guess my thought would be if you want to minimize the impact of the building, you do something with everything that you've designed above that red line on that parapet edge up there, and you create it such that anything above that blends in with um, the background. I suggested a gray scale might be a possibility. I would be willing to, to entertain a um, basically a modification in looking at what we would approve and having a requirement that the um, contractor, um, the business look at a little better um, uh, paint job maybe on those top items so that you would not be able to see them so well against the sky, against the mountains. And that would tend to meet what have you done specially to try to make this fit in with the environment. And then there's a little whimsical part of me that wants to recommend, gee, why don't we just have a roof garden? And uh, which would be wonderful ecologically, but that would cause a whole redesign, I think, of the structure. So my feeling is that we need to either require that more work be done to um, distinguish, so, so that the top appurtenments above that red line blend in more with the background, but I think we should go forward and approve this in some manner tonight. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and give my two cents at this time. Um, and I'm drawn to, I, I think, you know, when looking at the height exceptions, I'm drawn to the packet also, uh, the renderings. But uh, on page seven, I think it gives a real nice layout. And you get a good perspective of the building as a whole. And when I look at where the silos are, and to me, that's really not sticking out that much. So it just really, to me, and looking at the other renderings when they did it from the field, from, the, from Long Meadow, once again, it didn't really stand out that you could really pick them out. With the color, when I'm looking at it from the top here, two of those three units, uh, the, there's two of them in the middle of the building, and I'm really thinking that building is so long that you would really have to be at a considerable distance to even get the view from the angle to view them. And at that point, they would really be small anyways. So for me, the colors, I can live with the colors. And I can live with the solids just because I'm looking at the, the drawings and the renderings, they really don't stick out that much to me. And that's where I'm at. Commissioner Goldberg. I don't know if this question is for Mary or for Jessica Erickson, but I'm going to stick with Mary because she's actually on the agenda today. Mary, when you, when Smuckers agreed to build this plant in Longmont, were you aware of the height exception? We did, we did understand the height exception and that would, it would require variance. That was one thing when we went through, we went through a pretty exhaustive site selection process, okay. um, looking at multiple states and internal locations of property held by the company. Um, 
We've been working with a team that is, uh, I mean, you, you know your, your staff here is great, um, but Joni and uh, Don and Harold have been involved since the beginning and really working with us on these are what the limitations would be, this is what the, you know, any restrictions or possible um, roadblocks would be. And we talked through, you know, the, the silos and didn't understand that we would require a variance, but, you know, we talked through the justification that we've presented tonight and um, thought that it was a hurdle that we would be able to overcome. You must have had a contingency plan if you were unable to overcome that hurdle. What was that plan? We have. Um, I, I mean, we, we would look at multiple silos. I see. That. I see. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Rodriguez. Yeah, um, you know, again, I, I find that this is, is somewhat of a special circumstance because a lot of the issues that come before us are more of a, a suburban-urban context versus a quasi-rural or industrial context. And my point of view, uh, having grown up in this area, is that once we get more into the more rural areas, you start to see a little bit more agricultural industry or industry which actually does incorporate generally a lot of silos. So I, I do not see this as being some sort of, uh, you know, adverse effect on uh, aesthetics per se when we're talking about more rural, like when you're talking about a dairy or, or a cattle farm. Uh, these would be conversant usages in, in similar areas. And so I do not believe that we need to talk so much about the adverse effects of silos in this particular part of town. There's just, just an, an observation. Thank you. Commissioner Teta. And I don't feel like this is, uh, our purview or something we need to be getting involved in, but given the over $6 million in incentives that the city is um, giving them and their project, I wonder if maybe it's somebody else's business that if we were to uh, grant all the variances and I would think theoretically, if nothing else, uh, save them money, if not time and uh, redesign and everything uh, to go forward the way they would like to if there were not other uh, concessions that they might be asked to, to make that weren't, you know, part of the original agreement. Um, nothing, you know, I think that we should be involved in in terms of a condition or anything, but um, you'd think that that it would be worth something, that they could assign some kind of a monetary component to having the project proceed just exactly as they'd like it to with all of the variances being granted and no, uh, no difficulties or hurdles or roadblocks, um, any of which height-wise are entirely foreseeable and, and justifiable, I would think. Commissioner Height. Um, I can't be an activist judge and can only work with what's before us in the record. Um, and, and with that, I want to see if possibly I can embellish the record by asking Ms. Stotler, is there anything that you could do with respect to the design or screening or anything um, to add to these silos to make them less um, of a violation of this 45-foot height limitation? Is there, I mean, is it, can you think of anything that you could do? <clears throat> we could look at a color, color skin for the silo, seeing, right. you know, something that would be more uh, aesthetic than, than the white silo. White is the color that you're intending now? The, correct. Okay. Yep, that's a typical uh, industrial silo look and feel. So color. we could look at alternate colors. Could you paint it to look like a mountain? I, I made that up. Is there anything else that you could do? <laughs> uh, we haven't explored other options at this time, but um, you know, typically, we it's an industrial piece of equipment that is 
uh, more functional over form. So I haven't given a lot of, uh, of thought into additional alterations that could be made to it, but we could look at you know, color variations that would be more amenable. Okay. So to bring it back to my fellow commissioners, um, I hate to be pedantic, um, but the rule requires that they have come up with some type of creative design component that mm -hmm. I don't, it, it didn't happen. Um, and on that basis, again, I can support the, the thermal oxidizer and the, and the vaporizer screening. They, they've done something mm -hmm. there. Um, but with respect to the silos, we're just getting silos. Yeah. The design improvement has been operationally. The design improvement is a, a safer, higher quality production facility. And that was our interpretation of the, the design improvement was the impact on on the the product coming out of this facility. Which I'll add, I appreciate, um, but it doesn't meet the standard that I feel that I'm required to enforce. <clears throat> Commissioner Goldberg. I'd like to have Don come to the mic. Hey, Dan. Um, I appreciate your uh, short and succinct presentation today. Um, I wonder if you could shed some light on or just review your review uh, determinations. Um, you know, as Commissioner Height suggests, we are held to a standard as far as what we can't, why we can't approve this project. And one of the reasons isn't necessarily because we think it's good. So as it relates to the actual review criteria, can you just run through uh, your take on each of those criteria? Sure. Thanks. Um, so uh, just so I don't. They can be really short. Okay. So for a height exception, not only do we have the height exception criteria, but we still have to show that we meet the common review standards for uh, a major development application. So those are the 15020040 A uh, through E in our land development code. So that the, the A talks about being consistent with the LACP, um, any previous approvals, state statutes, codes, ordinances, and regulations. Um, again, believe that everything that is talked about tonight uh, is consistent with trying to meet the intent of the primary employment uh, land use category for this property, um, consistent from the standpoint of the goals and policies that are that are in the comprehensive plan and vision Longmont. Uh, the application complies with the design standards and construction specifications for street and utility layout design. Again, for the height exceptions, there is nothing that would cause the city a problem with being able to serve this facility, be that with water, sewer, electric, or even from an emergency standpoint, we can service and provide services to this property. Uh, consistent with the intent and purpose of the zone, I talked and copied out of the development code the intent uh, from the BLI zoning district, feel that uh, you know one of the things that they're, this is trying to do is set up a a campus or park type of uh, area with the large setbacks that they've set back from the adjacent streets, the landscaping that they're proposing, um, also getting into, again, this uh, design and the use, which is allowed in the BLI of um, medium industrial manufacturing type of a use. So again, consistent. And D is the application will not significantly adversely affect uh, the surrounding properties, the natural environment, or again, planned utility services. And the, again, the review of that was looking at, again, what, what properties are being most affected, how, how, what, what were the concerns and the issues that we received. Again, the adjacent property owners comment to the east about views being blocked, again, shown with that uh, example of the view from long view looking towards the west again believe that there is no more impact than the existing oil and gas facility from a view blocking area um, so again we found that that was that was met 
application includes appropriate transportation, multimodal access, uh, adjacent connections, sidewalks, trails. Again, from a standpoint of the height exception, that's kind of hard to show from it for those for the height. But in general, the overall use does meet our standards. They are going to be providing an access down to the greenway uh, for for the people that are going to be working there, so that they could use the future greenway, the Spring Gulch extension to be able to bike to work or to use that at, at lunchtime or before or after work if they wanted to. Um, so again, making good quality connections. So again, we felt those were uh, important. The, the last criteria is again is what Commissioner Height's been talking about, which is this height exception additional criteria. Again, it states all applications for height exceptions shall incorporate creative design such that it meets the purpose and intent of the standard being modified and represents an improvement in quality over what could have been accomplished through strict application of the standards. The, the one thing that I would uh, want to add to the discussion that has happened tonight is that when the design of this building was put together and when we were talking with Mary Francis and with the Smuckers representatives about the building, the the thing I want you to think about is um, our typical um, hotels that you've seen recently through some of the conditional uses. Think of the Harvest Junction development. Think of even some of the, the Walmart buildings, okay? Very large facilities, large structures. We have additional design standards for those facilities because of the commercial nature of them. We expect a higher design. We actually ask for additional fenestrations, setbacks in the buildings, things that change that elevation so we don't end up with a flat box. Okay? For those of you that can remember the Butterball plant, flat wall. I mean, that, that's what we had on all four sides of that building. And what they looked at, although I think it fit in well with their design of their facility, they have tried to meet and incorporate as much as they can that additional architectural treatment into this building that typically for an industrial building you would not have to do. So while I can't say that it is specific to the silo, the building doesn't get built without the silo. The silo is integral to the building and to the function of this business. So as I looked at it, I didn't look at it as individual pieces and parts. I looked at it as the whole that needed to be constructed in order to produce the product that they're making. That is how we came up with the justification to believe that they did incorporate things into the building design that mitigated and tried to mitigate the impacts of those silos and of those taller uh, rooftop units. And, and that's, that's that's the way that we tried to look at it and tried to make a finding that it met the requirements for the approval of the variance. Thanks, Don. I guess without further ado, uh, I respect Commissioner Height and Commissioner Height's concerns. Uh, I do every time he sits, uh, joins us behind the dais. Uh, and as I often state, he challenges me to uh, find the reasoning and the rationale um, behind uh, um, my motion. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to satisfy Commissioner Height today. Uh, but for the reasons eloquently summarized by um, Planner Burchett, I think uh, touching on the Review criteria 1502040, A through E, and then uh, the uh, summary that, the, that perhaps interpreting this project as a whole, not as an independent pieces, uh, meets the uh, improvement in quality over what could have been accomplished otherwise. Is that what I'm trying to read into? Uh, Letter of the of the criteria before us, Commissioner Height. So, um, I feel satisfied. I think this is a great project for our town, uh, and with that, I'd like to recommend approval of PZR 2017-16A. We have a motion on the table. Do we have a second? Second. 
We have a second. I'd also like to make a, a quick statement uh, in reference to Commissioner Height's um, discussion earlier. While I agree it does not meet the letter of code, uh, I do not necessarily believe that this is a deficiency on behalf of the applicant, but maybe a blind spot, possibly a blind spot in code for the city that we are currently in process of updating in the stance that we have not had a lot of applications of primary employment or employers in the city, and therefore we may not have conversant code to deal with some of the issues necessary to uh, accommodate primary employment in the city. And with that, I'll leave it at that. I would just like to add, once again, in looking at that rendering seven, and I know that we're, we're trying to look at the silos, um, and, and as we've noted, I don't know if you really can do much for silos, but I will say this. They have partially hidden the silos behind one of the buildings, and as I look at it on that rendering seven, there's also the landscaping along the west, or sorry, along the east edge of their property. And so the one thing that did strike me when they had the rendering from Longview, what jumped out at me is I noticed the trees. And I kind of had to really pay attention to the picture to notice the buildings behind the trees. So I think between the landscaping, where they set the silos with that building in front of it, I think they've done about as much as they can with silos. And, and I will say this, I actually like the white silos better than trying to paint them another color. The white silos almost blend in with the top of the building. So that's where I'm at, and I'm in uh, favor of this motion. Commissioner Flagg. As I pointed out earlier, actually that uh, condenser unit on the top of the building in black actually stands out far more than do the silos. And as was mentioned before, silos are usual in a rural area. I'd see no problem with that. I intend to support this. Do we have any more discussion on this topic? Are we ready for a vote? Let's vote. And this motion passes 6 to 11 with Commissioner Height against, or 6 to 1, sorry, with Commissioner Height against. You get 11 wow. What the heck? <laughs> uh, I will now read this. Uh, agenda item 5, Project Bronco Height Exception, the appeal process announcement. This item now enters a seven-day appeal period. During this time, any agreed party may appeal the commission's decision by submitting a written appeal letter stating why the Planning and Zoning Commission's decision should be amended or reversed by City Council. All appeals must be in writing and must be received in the city clerk's office and the planning office within the seven-day appeal period. The appeal period begins Thursday, March 23rd at 8 a.m. and ends Wednesday, March 29th at 5 p.m. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Okay. Are we okay to go on? Does anybody need a five-minute break? Okay. The next item on our list is the Longmont Storage Preliminary Plat, Conditional Use Site Plan and Annexation Concept Plan Amended, PZR 2017-15, Senior Planner Eva Perzhevsky. I always wanted to say that. Chair, Chair Poland, just, just bear with me. I wasn't prepared to get my PowerPoint up. Do you want to take two minutes? I think she needs a minute. Okay. Ava, do you need a couple of minutes? One. I just can't read the board, so I have to keep running. Oh, yeah. Super quick. Oh, just a quick. Next, we're just going to stay. But we still need to do this. Everybody, 
You know what they should do is paint beer cans. <laughs> beer cans. Definitely should be saying that. Are we ready, Ava? <laughs> We're ready. Thank you, Chair Jane, Paulin. Are we ready? Or do <laughs> okay. Ava, let's go with this. Uh, Chair Paulin, uh, Commissioner Ava Pahajewski, Planning Development Services. Uh, this is the Longmont Storage Preliminary Plant Condition and Use Site Plan application. Um, I'll start by just orienting you to the project site. Um, this is on the north side of Nelson Road. Um, it's west of Fordham Street and east of Anderson Street. Um, it's the Anderson RV storage. Um, this is Clover Basin self-storage here. Um, and it's eight acres, and then there's a residential subdivision south of it, south of Nelson Road. Um, and it was annexed in 2004 as part of the A.J. Martinez uh, business park annexation. Um, when the, the Martinez annexation came in, um, it was also on the concept plan for the annexation as self-storage. Um, that project never got off the ground, and so these are, these are new buyers. Um, and so the property is zoned BLI, Business Light Industrial. Um, Self-storage is a conditionally permitted use, which is why we're here tonight. Otherwise, it would be administratively reviewed through site plan. Um, the land use designation in, in Envision Longmont is mixed-use employment, and um, this is a use that would be allowed also, though it's also obviously allowed in the zoning. Um, and the property is part of the airport influence zone overlay. Um, which just means it's within 500 feet of Vance Brand Airport. And in our zoning code, um, talks about how development in the overlay has to comply with a couple of things. And one is um, the development can't create any type of electrical interference, which we don't see as, a, as an issue with this uh, pro project. And then secondly, there's height limits, which I think we've talked about a few months ago with the Firehouse Business Park related to the FAA Part 77 rule, which talks about takeoffs and landings and, um, you know, how tall a building can be a certain amount of feet away from the runway and so forth. So um, the request, there's three requests here, and I'm just going to kind of go by them one by one so you know what you're reviewing tonight. One is a concept plan amendment from the A.J. Martinez annexation. Um, the reason being when, um, and you have the original annexation concept plan in your packet, I didn't put that up here tonight, but generally this is Nelson Road over here on the left, it would be the south, this is north. Um, the original concept plan when it came in for annexation had proposed to save some existing, uh, the original farmhouse and the outbuildings, the silos and the barn and so forth, uh, were all proposed to stay, and that was up here off Nelson Road. And then the self-storage was all back in here. Um, and that was approved in 2004. Um, and the buildings have um, are kind of beyond repair at this point. Uh, so this applicant had proposed a project where they all are demoed, and then the, the self-storage, you know, the use is still the same. And so the HPC uh, went out to the, sorry, Historic Preservation Commission uh, went out to the site and did a visit to look and see if any of the buildings uh, still had historic significance or needed to be landmarked. Um, they did not see any, and so um, they took a vote and recommended to City Council that this uh, concept plan amendment go forward and that the buildings could be demolished because they don't have historic value. The second application is um, the preliminary plat, and because um, before you do development, you have to preliminary plat, then the final plat, and so um, we're just platting the property as it is. That's the preliminary plat, um, and so what you're seeing on here are the easements uh, that that are pretty typical. Um, in addition, on the plat, we had asked for right of way dedication, 30 feet of right of way here along Nelson. Um, so this. Uh, applicant will be giving 30 feet from their property uh, to the city dedication for right-of-way on Nelson Road improvements. 
Uh, in addition, um, they've platted back here. There is a future collector street on the Envision Longmont plan. This is the north. I'm sorry. I should have flipped it, but um, this was easier to look at. And so this is the north here, and there's a future collector street. And the city is still in the design process, so we don't know where exactly uh, the road right-of-way is going to touch on this property. And so the applicant has gone ahead and just dedicated uh, the land here until the city figures it out, and then we'll, we'll vacate it if we need to. And lastly, there's a 50-foot primary greenway dedication um, up on the northeast corner of the parcel here, um, and that's uh, for the Niwot Ditch uh, Greenway. And lastly, um, this is the conditional use site plan. Again, this is um, it's about 112,000 square feet. There's about 20 buildings total here. So um, there's some on the perimeter and, of course, in the center. And then, then up here is an office and a caretaker unit uh, that's two stories. Um, and the rest are all one-story self-storage buildings. And then up here in the northeast corner is a drainage detention pond. They are proposing a 30-foot <laughs> landscape buffer here along Nelson Road, which is city, city requirement. And there will be landscape buffers on all of their property line perimeters here on the east and west and up on the north. Um, and so we also have uh, specific use standards for self-storage businesses in our zoning code. And um, this project meets all of those. Uh, we worked through that. Um, it took us, took us a few iterations of planning, um, but we, we worked through it. So there are no variances requested with this application. Uh, it meets our landscaping, parking, um, design standards, et cetera. Um, and these are the elevations. Joel Siemens from Park Engineering representing the applicant uh, will go over that and the review criteria. But um, as we've talked about in the staff report, it's um, stucco and CMU combination. Um, they've got double, hor double story <laughs> windows here um, and then uh, metal standing seam roof and metal canopies as well. To uh, to add on to it, and then the, of course, this is just the internal part here um, where that wouldn't be visible from the public, that would be from the driveways. And so, um, just to recap, the, just to break down the different decisions. So, on the annexation concept plan amendment, um, Planning and Zoning Commission is not the final decision maker, City Council is. So, you would be making a recommendation to City Council, recommendation of approval or denial. Um, and then on the plat and the site plan, you are the decision makers on that, unless, of course, they're appealed, then council would be. Um, and so we've put um, the resolutions in your packet, and based on our analysis, uh, we've got six conditions in there, and I think it's in PZR 2017-15B. Um, one is um, that we've asked the applicant to do, uh, contact the FAA to start that aeronautical study to confirm that they would be in compliance uh, with Part 77. Um, and seeing as most of the buildings are one story, except for the caretaker and front office, um, it appears it might be OK, but you know, we want that confirmation. Um, the second condition we've asked for uh, is uh, this is all based out of the environmental report that we received and that I talked about in the staff report. But the environmental report made a few recommendations. And so we've just taken those recommendations and put them on as conditions. Um, and so that would be up to your discretion if you'd like to leave them or remove some. And Joel can talk about those as well. But um, the, one is the applicant request a jurisdictional determination from the Army Corps. Um, as to whether um, their consultation is required for this project, um, that was you know, recommended. Um, that they obtain a determination of no significant impact from fish and wildlife um, regarding this, uh, the Preble's mouse habitat. Um, and I can't read the last of <laughs> it. I have to give my staff report. Um, Oh, the tree mitigation fee. So there are some trees on the property, and our city forester reviewed it. Um, they can't save any of them for the project. And so the city forester has looked at the inventory, determined the value, and gave us that amount. And so we've added that as a condition of approval that the applicant pay that tree mitigation fee to go into the tree mitigation fund. Um, and lastly, um, again, as, as we always do as a standard condition, our staff always have, um, you know, some minor corrections toward this end of the stage of the, the plans uh, when we're 
getting ready to do the finalization of them. And so we just, you know, remind the applicant that they, even if they get approval tonight, they still need to um, get staff's uh, final approval from the DRC um, on the project plans. And so that concludes uh, my presentation. Joel Siemens is here to do a presentation and talk about the review criteria. And then, you know, we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thanks. Okay. Joel. Hello, my name is Joel Siemens, owner of Park Engineering at 420 21st Avenue. Hello, thanks. They say second time is a charm, so here I am. So we're here as well with one of the owners, uh, Paul, who's right uh, with us. Uh, Paul and Bill, they own uh, five uh, storage facilities in Longmont, and this will be their sixth. Their experience with uh, putting uh, storage facilities together and the processes. Um, let's see here. I won't uh, belabor some of the preliminaries, but um, the Longmont storage facility is located uh, directly west of the uh, existing Clover Basin uh, storage facility, um, which goes and runs parallel with a lot of the uh, review criteria analysis um, that we'll go into in, in just a little bit. As Ava has uh, expressed, uh, the first concept, uh, uh, the change of the annexation concept uh, was reviewed by the Historic Preservation Commission. This meeting was held in November, just a few short months ago, and they ruled that uh, there was no historical value to the building. And so thus uh, the staff's recommendation to proceed with that change. And the other two uh, items on the Docket have to do with the review criteria analysis for both the um, uh, preliminary plat and also the uh, cost, which is a conditional use. So the first, uh, we have to meet the common review criteria. Um, so the first question is, are you consistent with Envision Longmont or the LACP? And one of the goals of the project is to recruit, support, and and incentivize and retain quality businesses. Well, that's one of the, sorry, one of the goals of the LACP. And a comprehensive range of job opportunities and promote economic diversity, which this project does do. So I tried to claim that goal as, as their own, but it's not, it's the, it's the LACPs. Um, the second is uh, we are in agreement with the um, concession of the 30 foot right of way to, um, to the transportation plans that are um, in the future, so uh, that has been uh, that is part of the preliminary and will be part of the final pro planning process to uh, yield that um, land up. The second is uh, to comply with the applicable design standards, and so I've brought a utility plan which shows probably more information than you need, but it, it does show that we are going to be routing a, a water line, a city water line through the facilities and also be connecting to the, to the, um, to the potable water system to the east and um, thus it will improve both serviceability and water quality for both properties because there will be less dead end lines and uh, the, again, the serviceability will be increased. The initial driveway widths were set at about 26 feet, which is okay for the fire department, but the code insisted that we needed 32 feet between um, facilities for ease of, of flow and maintenance. So we have uh, conceded and, and uh, altered the plan to have uh, 32 feet between uh, for the driveway widths. 
Um, it is uh, compatible with the uh, neighborhood existing. So we, we've talked about uh, the existing neighbor here. Uh, we, I've, I've met them, and, and they're, uh, again, the existing storage facility. Um, there will be future development on the north side. That's still in, in process, but um, part of the reason the the project is um, going a little slower than we'd like is because there was um, we met with Phil and some of the other traffic uh, engineers with the city and and we're coordinating to make sure that there's enough right away on the north side to allow uh, the collector that will eventually tie into Anderson and so we've coordinated that both uh, vertically and horizontally to make sure that's feasible um, the South side, again, all these are oriented the same way. So south is on the left and north is on the right. On the south side, I've talked to the landscape architect and they have um, described this area as being very, very dense. We have two rows of trees and shrubs, one against the building and one um, right against the newly given right of way. And so it gives sort of a two deep um, feel for um, the area there. It's, it also covers, because of the limiting quantity of where trees can be planted, is a necessity to get uh, the total trees and shrubs and put a lot of them in, in that area, which is um, the most visible, so has the most uh, impact, positive impact. Uh, the fourth uh, letter D it will not significantly uh, adversely affect uh, these surrounding properties. We have uh, designed and are proposing to install a, a, a water quality pond and detention facility that will mitigate uh, stormwater flows and also increase the water quality to uh, waters that are discharged to the existing ditch on this side. And so they're being very responsible. And it's a size to handle all the impervious area, which is quite a bit because um, the majority of the area is either pavement or rooftop. So we had to size it uh, to meet that uh, quantity. There's actual additional uh, four bays that are now um, required since um, 2014. Um, which actually add an additional uh, level of water quality. So when the water initially discharges into the pond, this is probably are, are all boring, but it, it's an additional level of water quality. So it, it actually settles the water before it gets into the pond. And then there's a micro pool toward the end that also settles out another facility. Um, it's just a, a deeper pool that will allow clean water to exit. So. The both water quality and water quantity is, is being taken care of here. Um, let's see. How do I go in reverse? <laughs> Previous, there we go. Okay. So uh, one of the other items that we we're encouraged to do is to uh, share the access with Clover Basin on uh, Nelson. That's uh, safety and also um, uh, uh, efficiency feature that helps flow traffic flows through um, through Nelson. So it it makes us merge before we come on to Nelson rather than just going in willy nilly. So that we've coordinated that. Uh, we are, we're required to do a lighting plan and. Uh, and our, our project plan does meet the city standards for lighting and hours of operation. During our neighborhood meeting, there was a concern of the existing sign actually for Clover Basin shedding too much light in the neighbors to the south. Uh, but actually, they probably made more changes than we did <laughs> because because um, he was in attendance, uh, the the neighbor who's uh, doing the storage facility. So anyway, we we took in those uh, those items to effect to make sure that. Um, our foot candles, our levels of light are clearly on our site and we're not spraying light everywhere. Uh, we already talked about the right-of-way dedication. Now, um, the uh, environmental report is, uh, includes three of the recommendations uh, that are part of 
uh, Ava's recommended uh, recommendation. Did I say that one too many times? Um, the first is that um, the Army Corps would like to review the um, project uh, since the Niwot Ditch could be as a designated waterway. So it's not, it hasn't been designated as such, but we just, they just want us to contact to make sure that we're okay and they're okay with, with that. And so um, the second is uh, the Fish and Wildlife. Um, and these are all recommendations from the report. Um, the Preble's Jumping Mouse, uh, which they hadn't uh, found any on site, they, again, as, as precautionary, they want us to contact U.S. Fish and Wildlife to make sure that it's okay to proceed um, as, as, as we are proposing. And the last is uh, they're recommending um, a pre-construction inspection for the mountain plovers, um, which, again, no mountain plovers were found on site, but as precautionary, they want to do inspection before construction uh, begins. And again, um, additional information can be provided. Have they been provided this? No. But uh, I do have a copy here if you want to pass around, and it does have basically the same things I, I said. Okay. But I'll have it if you want to refer to it. A stormwater management will be uh, a, uh, a item that will be villi uh, diligent about, especially because uh, of the heightened restrictions on the state level. Um, the there we go. The site basically flows from south to north, so um, uh, the, all the stormwater flows are collected into that pond, and so there's not a lot of there. Are, there are perimeter um, discharges, but it's all coming off of landscape buffers and whatnot, so the impact is very very low. Um, we have provided a multimodal plan per code. Uh, a lot of the communication is just west-east along Nelson. Um, a uh, sidewalk is being proposed, also uh, a connection point to the buildings here. Um, because the facility is largely gated, there's not, you know, integration throughout, but uh, a added connection as this street comes through is going to benefit both the fire department and uh, the facility itself with added flow both on the north side and the south side when that when that can when that street comes through in the meantime the fire department has asked us to coordinate with the neighbor to the north which we know and we're currently coordinating with them to get an emergency access out to Anderson through the property so it'd be a temper uh, a temporary easement that uh, we're again working with them to to accomplish uh, fire station five is just a couple of blocks away. It's um, maybe a half a mile away, so the the response time is is very low. Now, with the uh, preliminary plat, there's just three uh, review criteria that we were asked to meet. It will not limit the ability of um, the surrounding land to be developed or annexed, and it's not boxing in any uh, adjacent lots. So it's it's uh, very straightforward that way. The second criteria is that it doesn't create any lots that are undevelopable. Again, it's just one lot, and so it doesn't uh, hinder any um, development that way. Uh, the last is the applicant proposes, um, sorry, the proposed phasing plan for development of the subdivision is rational in terms of availability infrastructure capacity and adequate public facility standards. And so we are um, proposing to do it in one phase. And so the access will be bought in, the water line, the, um, the pond, the sanitary connection to the caretaker's house, all these things and, and the lighting will all be uh, established at, at one time. So there won't be a, a phasing of sorts. But uh, we do appreciate your your time, and we uh, look forward to a positive uh, uh, response uh, from you. If you have any questions for myself, um, again, uh, Joel Siemens, Park Engineering, 
And uh, Paul, uh, the owner, is also here to ask any marketing or storage questions. Thank you, Thank you Joel. Yep. Uh, does at this time, Commissioner Teta. I just had two quick questions for you, Joel. Yeah. The um, most recently constructed similar uh, owner storage facilities are where in town? Uh, Which ones? It's a good question. There's a couple in the queue right now. Um, how about second? The one by Lowe's. Well, well, Clover Basin, obviously. I just didn't know if there's anybody. There's one in Gar uh, Harvest Junction, Joni's saying. Uh, on the Lowe's um, side, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah really nice. I've, I've been there. Right. Okay. And uh, um, second question I had was uh, the uh, height uh, restriction or uh, uh, that you were working with, was it going from south to to uh, north that you couldn't that they they couldn't step up in height by changing the grade because of the uh, how that might impact the airport influence zone or no I think and correct me if I'm wrong Paul um, I think most of the storage units are just one story anyway so um, the the architectural feature and the caretaker's house is just on the south side so it wasn't a matter of limiting the storage area in the back it's just that we needed to, our discharge point was the ditch, so we basically had to elevate everything to make sure everything drained that way rather than inundating Nelson and causing water problems. So we are proposing to add some fill on the south side to make sure we catch all our water, treat it, and release it versus store. But we, yeah, we, we don't mind um, talking to uh, the FAA and, and uh, making sure we're okay on that front. Commissioner Flake. In regards to the detention pond area there on the northeast part of the site, um, it looks like there's a fence around the part that's towards the storage unit. Is there to be a fence around the part that's not in the storage unit? And is that an area that should someone end up walking through there, it would be safe? Whoops. I think I clicked where I should have clicked. I'm being shunned currently, so. There is, a, as part of the pond, a uh, access path that we're encouraged to um, uh, make so the, um, the pond itself is accessible for maintenance. Basically, at the worst part, you just need a wheelbarrow and a shovel to to uh, go down there and clean out some of the muck on the on the water quality features and then cart it away. It's also designed to potentially push a snow uh, from the aisleways into the into the uh, pond area, so it's out of the way and eventually melts, and it's exactly where we want it to go. Uh, but yes, it, the fence uh, is designed to be a, a safe feature um, to keep. Keep everybody well. For, uh, there's not random pedestrians in there. Usually, when they come in, they get their stuff and they go. But, uh, so it's not like a pocket park feature or anything. I was concerned more from since I noticed you have kind of a fence area there. What about from outside? I, there's going to be a road there eventually, or something perhaps, or uh, other development. We'd have to coordinate, um, as Ava had said, after the gives and takes of the roads are given, there'll be some space there to allocate back to the property for gates and security. But yes, it will be fenced on the backside as well currently. And so the only thing coming out to the north will be a pipe going to the ditch. So yeah. uh, there'll, be, there'll be a breakaway fence for the fire department so they can come and take a left and go out. Uh, but that will also be fenced, but it's something they can plow through. Commissioner Height. Commissioner Flagg anticipates my questions again. Um, Mr. Siemens, is it Mr. DeThomas? Yes. Um, my questions aren't really review criteria based, but they're more practically based, which is, you know, with this road coming in eventually, sometime in the future in the back, um, might not you want to be able to have access to your facility from that road, and are you prepared to accommodate that at some point in time as well as a landscape buffer for 
the back of your facility, which will abut a road at some point in time? That, that's a good question. Um, the, it is desired by everyone, the city and the client, uh, this connection. Um, the right-of-way will automatically include an eight-foot a tree lawn as part of that. So there'll be a, a sort of turnkey landscape piece as part of the road that is, is, uh, will be part of that. Um, past that, again, we'll do final details and maybe administratively at when that point comes to install a gate or um, additional connection because it's sort of a nuts and bolts thing down the road, but yeah, we we will make sure to make sure we we get the uh, landscape feature. But but part of that road will include that eight foot tree lawn buffer, which comes with the road. Yep. Do we have any other further questions? Okay, um, this is a public hearing item, uh, so at this time I will open this up to the public. Does anybody on the sheet? There is nobody on the sheet. If anybody in the audience at this time would like to come up and speak to this item, you'll be given five minutes. Seeing nobody coming forward, I'll go ahead and close the public the public hearing item, part of this uh, part of this item, yeah, uh, and bring it back to the commission for further discussion. Commissioner Height. Planner Parashevsky, I have a question for you, um, and I don't know if you'll be able to answer it, so maybe Ms. Marsh can, can um, add in. In 2004, this concept plan um, specifically was going to keep a house, um, some other farm equipment. Do you understand, or do we know why that was part of this annexation agreement? Yes, Chair Paul and Commissioner Hyatt, there was a historic survey done in 2004 with the annexation process. Um, and at the time, I think the, the residential home and the outbuildings were in much better condition. Um, and so the Historic Preservation Commission had looked at it and determined that it would be a good thing to save them. They didn't think that it was, it was necessary to designate them as landmarks per se, but they thought it would be a good idea to save the buildings. And the previous owner of the property uh, agreed to that and so designed the concept plan around that. Um, but it, you know, it's been more than 10 years and, and they had not been maintained since then. And so they're at a point where, well, the applicant will speak more to it because they are on the premises more, but I've, we've been told that they're in very bad disrepair to the point where it would not be cost effective to rehab them. Um, and so we brought the historic preservation over um, to look at it and make a de another determination in the present time. Um, and they looked at it and determined that um, there was um, no significant event or, or owner or uh, value of, of the house uh, that would make them feel like it, would, it should stay the way it is and, and leave the concept plan as it is and not demolish the buildings. Uh, so they voted. Uh, to recommend approval of this new concept plan. Which then begets my next question, and it might be for the applicant as well, which is what happened in the intervening 13 years? How did this property fall into such disrepair, if you know? <clears throat> Alder Thomas, uh, 7486 Old Mill Trail. Um, A.J. Martinez, I believe, wanted to keep the house in order to save money, he was going to use it as his office, basically, uh, to run the self-storage business out of. Um, he basically ran out of money and um, then basically lost the property and they hadn't been maintained for 10 years plus. And when the Historical Society came out, they basically said they were in such disrepair. That was one of the other items besides just being um, no historical value. They were in, <coughs> some of them are literally falling down. And also, in order to grade the property properly, we need to bring in some fill dirt that would basically cover the whole, like, bottom two, three feet of the house. Also, the house is on that 30-foot right-of-way that is Nelson Road that we're dedicating. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you have any further questions, Commissioner Hyde, at this time? No, not 
Commissioner Kohler. Um, I have some questions. I don't know if they're for you, Ava, or the applicant, about the ecological resource survey and the recommendations that came out of that. Um, my first question is, is any work actually, any disturbance actually being proposed to the ditch? Um, uh, Joel Siemens, Park Engineering. We're uh, in part of our design was to make sure not to impede any flow in that ditch. And so as you come closer and closer to uh, a wetland or what have you, the probability is higher, as, as they would say, to finding habitats or, or whatnot. Uh, but our, so there's two views of it, hydraulically and also via nature. Our, our job is to make sure we detain before we come in to discharge into that ditch to make sure the flow continues and we just release at a historic rate. And so that also means that we're on the high side of the ditch um, so we don't disturb. Now, now, when additional roads come in, there's going to have to be culverts and bridges and, and whatnot to uh, accommodate because they have to cross that ditch to get to the other side. But, but you're not proposing to do any grading no. of the ditch or anything like that? The short answer is no. Is that all you needed? Uh, do you, would you like to? Yeah, read I wouldn't the mind at it. Um, my concern, and the reason why I asked that question is, I saw that the recommendation actually said that you should request a jurisdictional determination from the Army Corps, and that's a very official process. In my experience, it's been, you know, that process can take years. I'm wondering if that's really what they want to be asking. Um, it seems more appropriate that you just need to request, um, or maybe it'd be more appropriate to say you know, to act, contact the Army Corps, Corps of Engineers to see if they need to be involved in the project. Um, that might be better wording. Um, I'm afraid that the, if, if we agreed to the condition like this, you would might be stuck into getting an actual JD is what they call it from the Corps, mm -hmm. and that might be more than you want to sign on to. We, we appreciate that. Um, all three conditions recommended in that report are sort of what ifs, and they're, uh, we, the, it could be a, a water of district, but why don't you talk to them just in case? And there could be m mice, but why don't you talk to them just in case? And, and so there's three different um, entities, but, you know, the core of the Fish and Wildlife and also the pre-construction inspection. And so, yeah, I think that might be better wording. Yeah, just to determine basically if Army Corps consultation is required. Right. Yeah. Um, and then my next question is about the, it sounds like there's going to be some trees removed. On the property? Uh, yes, uh, landscape architect is not here, but um, they were in positions where they could not be salvaged. Ken, when he did his uh, Wickland, when he did his inspection, uh, put a value to that tree, and uh, we are, as a, as a team, required to pay that amount and, and then proceed by by planting our required amount of trees. But also, um, there's 8,000, I think, is the sum to. Uh, to the tree mitigation fund. Was there any um, reference in the survey document about um, doing migratory bird surveys for nesting birds of those trees before you cut them down? Um, those are the only three recommendations out of the report. Um, I didn't look for any additional um, recommendations from the other birds or other species, but they, they do organize it by paragraph, so you can look. Okay. Um, Ava, do you know uh, if that's something standard that the city would require? It seems to me that you shouldn't really cut a tree down, at least not in the breeding season, unless you've done a pre-construction survey. Uh, Commissioner Kohler, yes. Um, in the report, it talks about um, that they found no evidence of the birds um, in the trees or around it. So, um, uh, so no, they, they did survey it. They did survey the trees and, and whether there were birds there. Do you or know not. when construction would take place or the trees would be cut down? No one would have any idea of that at this point because they would still have to submit a final plat and public improvement plans. We do a public improvement agreement. It could be another six months, eight months. I mean, we just don't know all the variables at this point. Yeah, and I think that's why it would be better to have probably an additional condition that added the requirement for a pre-construction nest survey just to make sure that, you know, if it was a year before construction started and a bird were to go and nest in that tree, then it wouldn't be cut down. And, you know, that's, it, that's a violation of a federal law, so you'd want to protect mm -hmm. yourself from right. that. Right. 
And I just, uh, one more thing, I just wanted, if you've got the report there, so if you see page 15, that is where the recommendation was regarding Army Corps. And just for the benefit of the other commissioners who don't have it in front of them, um, their recommendations, it says, the Niwot Ditch may be waters of the U.S. subject to regulation under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act. Uh, we recommend requesting a jurisdictional determination from the Corps to determine if Corps consultation is required. Are you all set? Commissioner Teta. I, uh, as I said, I'm familiar with these uh, storage facilities and their uh, high quality. I'm in favor of the uh, project. I think it's going to be a good addition. I had a couple quick uh, questions, though, for Ava. One, um, a couple of projects ago, the, uh, the uh, multifamily project there off Nelson, we talked about the the uh, improvements for Nelson between airport and Fordham. And uh, just wondering if you or anybody recalls the timeline. I know we don't have any transportation people here tonight. When, when the... Uh, Chair Poland, Commissioner Teda, so you're talking about um, the project that was on the south side of Nelson Road. That right. We, and, and we talked about future... Exactly. ...transportation infrastructure. Um, I think Tyler had said that it was a long-range capital improvement program plan to widen it. Right. Um, but he did not have a specific okay. time frame, and it was in the, I think he believed, I believe he said the five to ten year range. And I feel like we're asking plenty from this, from the applicant here, and I don't in expect there'd be a lot of uh, traffic impact from them, but, but uh, there is... Uh, a lot of increased traffic, mostly probably coming out of Boulder um, in the afternoon commuting kind of traffic, uh, necessitating some improvements there. And then the two other things, I wondered uh, to Commissioner Kohler's point about the uh, forester or forestry report, um, I wondered if it would be appropriate going forward if we could get copies of those kinds of reports. I don't know that everybody would find it interesting, the uh, Forrester's report and the, uh, the uh, Airport Advisory Committee, if they have a report. So, uh, Chair Poll and Commissioner Teta, so um, was it not in your attachments? I thought um, in attachment three, it was correspondence, the attachment that had the correspondence. I, um, Ken Wickland, our city forester, does not write a formal report. He usually sends me an email. It's very informal. Oh, wow. um, and so I thought that I had put that in the packet, and it might have been one of the last pages in there. Um, but, yeah, we as staff can, can no certainly can put his, e they're, like I said, they're not reports. They're typically emails. They're very informal. He just says, just curious, here's you know, the what trees, trees, here's the caliper, the caliper here's the value, are, and how, yeah, we, yeah. I, I thought that was in this packet, but certainly we can absolutely put that in going forward. Anyway, like I said, I'm in favor of it. Thank you. Commissioner Flagg. Uh, just a point of information, I think. Plovers generally nest on the ground and not in trees. And so when they hatch, the little birds just run all over, immediately eating anything that's within travel range of their feet. So I thought I should mention that in passing. Thank you. Commissioner Goldberg. I think I have a question or two for Joel or Paul, whoever's most excited to come on down. Hey, Joel. Thanks for being here tonight. You bet. Joel, there must be something more exciting happening in town or on TV to have the public stay at home and not let us hear their opinion on our projects today. Mm. Typically, they do a great job of letting us know uh, the strengths and weaknesses of the projects before us. As they did seven days ago. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that said, we are wildly sensitive to the feedback from the neighbors and those impacted the most. Uh, 
at your neighborhood meeting, there were several attendees, again, all of which not in attendance today, uh, that raised some concerns. And I wonder if, just as I asked the Smucker applicant to summarize, I wonder if you could shed some light on how that meeting went and what were some of the challenges or concerns raised and what you have done to address them. Um, the neighborhood meeting was a good time ago. I still have the minutes in my file. Sure. This is what I recall. Um, a lot of it had to do with um, Nelson traffic. Um, it talked about, um, and it seemed to focus a lot of uh, other projects because the apartment project was going on at about the same time as, as conceptual at that point. And so they're talking about the apartments going in at um, Nelson and um, Airport, and then they're talking about um, the um, effects of the existing storage facility there. And, and, and for example, the neighbor was talking about the, the light from the lighted sun right. and how it sprayed and, and whatnot, and some of the effects uh, from that. Um, Maybe I can help you. I have that script too. Good. But what I'm really interested in is the temperament, you know, and what the attitudes were like in the room. So maybe if I just mention a few of the concerns, uh, how much grading will be needed next to it and consider the mitigation on grading and dust and impact. I have what was proposed at the time, but do you have anything to add relating to that concern? I do recall talking about some of the construction processes uh, since 2014. Um, we've had uh, four or five, uh, some have gone on to other cities, municipalities, but they're specifically in charge of uh, John Allen and uh, Judah's team to ta look at and control dust abatement and um, uh, making sure silt fencing is up and all the inlets are properly uh, uh, shielded so the sediment doesn't get in. Uh, but we reiterate the point where um, if there is um, a lot of exposed dirt, that that needs to be wetted down with water trucks in the mass grading process because we will be bringing uh, dirt in and elevating the site and we'll have to control that. And also the water will allow us to get proper compaction to do that, to get a good base, a uh, firm base. But uh, that was uh, raised as well. They were concerned about that. Um, uh, but this is an issue you've dealt with in the past. Yes. And yes, it is. Um, are sensitive to. Mm -hmm. uh, especially, I mean, the uh, tracking on the Nelson will be heightened because it is an arterial. And so it's different than the sort of bleeding on water or bleeding dirt onto like Grandview Meadows or a, a local road, it'll be more pertinent. So I think they'll have to make sure that their uh, vehicle tracking pads are efficient and working um, so we don't track uh, dirt onto Nelson and maybe have um, a longer pad or, or something like that. But that's that'll be uh, sort of part of the pre-grading and pre-construction meeting, which will be a little ways on. Uh, you've already addressed some of the concerns about lighting and impact on the residential areas. Mm -hmm. Our code has pretty strict requirements about uh, the ability for, for the allowance of light to pass the property line, which I, I think is zero. I think it can be zero foot candles at the property line. Uh, so it sounds like you're prepared to tackle that landscaping and buffer from residential. I think this ties into just having commercial next to residential. Do you have anything to add about that concern that we haven't addressed yet? No, I've, I've actually met all four sides of the property. Um, Paul uh, Tahar, is that his name? Is directly to the west. And he hasn't uh, come into the city yet, but he has similar ideas of um, development, non-residential development. And um, on, again, on the east is, is the storage, and on the north, because of the ditch, there is going to be a, a natural open space greenway that will mm -hmm. follow the ditch. Mm -hmm. And so that by itself will, will give it some buffer from the residential that uh, Ken Spencer and, and, and some of the other people developing that will, will provide. Uh, there's a, the balance area, let's see, is this a pointer? Oh, it doesn't? Okay. The well, last time I used this, I got in trouble, so. Okay. 
No, no, this one's fine. So, um, so there's a wedged area right here on the northwest corner that will be created um, as, as the road has to bend north and then mm -hmm. tie back into Nelson. There's a small bit of area that will be developed. It's labeled as mixed use right now, so maybe some um, office uh, buildings or, or things of that nature that would help transition from the residential to, to the storage. But, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a good compatible use, um, so there won't be a lot of effects. We, uh, in fact, we tried to initially coordinate with Clover Basin to see if we get a semi come through and loop through our site to their site and loop back to go both ways so it helped with circulation, but they didn't want to do that. So, There's just a couple more if you just bear with me. Sure. Uh, one concern relates to the noise from the gates and the construction. Now, in, we have in the past had um, a, condition, a condition or a request from the applicant to use uh, to, for the construction equipment to have a different noise, a, a white noise beep or something like that. Uh, ha are you able to take any action to help alleviate any concern about just the noise of machinery and what have you? Um, I haven't addressed that, quite honestly, uh, historically. I, I know there's construction hours, so at 7 o'clock um, mm -hmm. we can go. Um, I've, <laughs> I've heard stories on, a, on an off subject where there's actually drag races on one job site where <laughs> they started off at 6.30 and went up. Anyway, that's, uh, I thought it was pretty happening. funny. But not not at this location, of course not. Uh, but there's, um, yeah, as far as decibels or measuring that or quantifying uh, the noise, um, I'm, I'm not sure I've seen additional mufflers put on earth movers or anything like that. Um, but I, I, okay. I, I don't know how to address that. Okay. Uh, you've addressed the water main concern um, in your presentation, and then that leaves uh, the traffic access. And I, I think in, in our packet, even to date, we don't have a traffic study. Uh, Ava, maybe you can address what sort of traffic impacts we see from storage facilities. Uh, Commissioner Goldberg, uh, no traffic study was required with this application, um, and I double-checked with Tyler, um, and he said no. Don't need one. Um, what sort of? I do not know what trip generation traf, uh, self storage facilities make off the top of my head, unfortunately. Um, but it was not enough to warrant a traffic study by our traffic engineering department. Thank you. So it sounds like if a storage facility was uh, likely to create a lot of traffic, we would probably require a traffic study for that type of project. But this does not. This has not triggered that need. Thanks, Joel. Do we have any other questions, comments? Anybody would like to put forth a motion? Commissioner Teta. I'd like to uh, move that we adopt PZR 2017-15B as uh, recommended by staff. <coughs> Commissioner Kohler. Um, how would we go about getting some changes to the conditions added to that if it's just, you know, and adding addi additional recommendations and then changing the language of one? Uh, Chair Poland, Commissioner Kohler. I guess there are a couple of ways that could happen. Either a motion could be made to adopt PZRB but with differences or a motion could be made and seconded to adopt PZRB, and then we do another layer of procedure where uh, another member moves to amend that motion by changing the language in PZRB. Commissioner Teta. I have no problem with uh, amending the language, however, Commissioner Culler. Sees fit. Okay, so then do we need to close his motion? And it's, a friendly it's, a it's a friendly, friendly amendment, right? Chair okay. Paulin, it was never seconded. It can be withdrawn. Do you, want, do, you want, do you want to withdraw it, and then she can put forward with her? Absolutely. I'll, I'll withdraw. Okay, so I make a motion that we 
recommend approval of PZR 2017-15B um, with the following changes. Um, for condition number two, I suggest we change the language from request a jurisdictional determination to just change that to determine, the word determine. Um, in addition, I request that we add another condition that says uh, conduct pre-construction pre uh, nesting surveys during the breeding season prior to uh, tree removal. Assistant City Attorney Kramer, you kind of have a quizzical look on your face. Chair Pullen, sometimes uh, that's just how I look. Um, <laughs> let's see. I, I take it that the that second amendment um, is the applicant shall dot 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 what you said. Yes. Also, this is a this is the kind of thing I hesitate to say, but I bring it up when. Um, when we're dealing with conditions, have in mind built into these conditions, what happens if they're not met? Um, so a survey, the as phrased condition would be to require the applicant to conduct a survey. Does it matter what the survey says? The survey says this will kill lots of birds is it just the, the, the conducting of the survey that we're asking for, or is there something substantive, just to have that kind of thing in mind? Well, I think it reads similar to the conditions that are in there now, which basically just require surveys. Um, but if the applicant were not to conduct a survey, there would be, would be a bird nesting, let's say, and they cut down the tree, it would be their liability. They'd be in violation of the federal law. So I guess I don't know what the city's perspective is on that. If, Chairman Pullen and Commissioner Culler, so, uh, so the city's perspective would be we absolutely can ask someone to provide that information. Then our natural resources staff typically takes a look at all our ecological surveys um, as well as any, um, anything having to do with raptors. And they also keep track of all the raptors around town because uh, Colorado's uh, CPW doesn't always know where they are, but our natural resources folks do. So in coordination with them, um, we're able to, to carry that out and then get back to someone with what they, their obligation would be because absolutely that would be a very large liability if you chose to uh, do that on your own accord. So I think that, I think that condition makes sense to me. Okay. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? Do we have comments? We have another, I would like to also, under number four, since we've just talked about how these things need to have an ends or result from them, the applicant shall have an environmental consultant conduct pre-construction inspection during clover breeding, et cetera, with the written results being submitted to the city planning office, and I would suggest for added determinations. Commissioner Kohler, are you okay with the? Yes. Okay. Commissioner Teta. If nobody else has a problem with that friendly amendment, I'd like to second them. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Do we have <laughs> any further discussion? If not, let's go ahead and take a vote. This item passes seven to zero. This item will now be forwarded to the Longmont City Council for action. If you are unfamiliar with council procedures and intend to appear before council, please contact the Planning Division for further information at 303-651-8330. Okay. We will now move to other business. Um, final call, public invited to be heard. Was there anybody on the list? No, would anybody in the audience like to come forward and speak to something that was not discussed today? Seeing nobody moving forward, I will close the final call public invited to be heard. Items from the commission. 
Items from Council Representative Bonnie Finley. I have no items for you. Very good. Items from the Planning and Development Services Director. So for April, we will only have one meeting. And as of uh, right now, the only item that will be on that meeting will be code amendments. So Brian will be back before you with some, um, some items for review. Um, I don't know what those are off the top of my head, but that's, we definitely will not have two meetings. Thank you. What are those dates, Joni? And what's that date? Come on. I think it's April 19th. 19th. Yes, I'm reading from. And if there's nothing else, then we are in adjournment. Very good. Nice job.